Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 244, featuring the first part of a new interview series with none other than Robert Suratek, one of the co-founders of Suratek Software, the company responsible for the Wizardry series, and much, much more. In this part of the interview, we focus in on the, uh, the origins of Suratek and how Robert got uh, into the company and, and about his background in programming and marketing. Anyway, we've got a lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Suratek. All right, folks, I am here with the great Robert Sirotech, the co-founder and vice president of Surtech Software, a company I'll, I'll assume you're familiar with if you uh, watch this show. He's a 34-year veteran of the games industry with roots going all the way back to 1967. So maybe we could start there, Robert. And uh, what was going on in 1967? 1967, well, I was 11 years old, pretty young kid, considering, I think, uh, the PC obviously wasn't invented then, but I was uh, I was uh, living in Canada at the time, and uh, that was Canada's hundredth birthday. So my parents brought me to Montreal, where there was a thing called the Montreal uh, Expo going on, Can Canadian Expo, and uh, they hauled me into the Czech Pavilion, which is where my namesake comes from. And uh, while we were there, we were seated in an auditorium to watch a movie. And this movie basically uh, would roll and then stop. And there were three buttons on the back of, of each of the chairs that, uh, that we were seated in. And um, we would press one of three buttons. And that would determine through calculating the majority of the people, if they pressed A, it would determine to go to move the to move the movie down that particular branch in the tree. If B was pressed, then it would go down another storyline and C, same thing. So you had basically the very first signs of an interactive media. And I was absolutely enthralled with that. It really took me. And of course, I had no clue that ultimately uh what uh 20 years later or so. Uh, sorry, 10 years later, I would be uh, finding myself in the video game industry. But when I found the video game industry emerging, of course, it didn't take me long to, uh, to really uh, latch onto it and see the potential. Sounds like a choose your own adventure in video form. Exactly. Uh, you mentioned the Czech Pavilion, I believe, right? Is that, I was reading That's... something about your family has a castle there, or what's the, the, the uh, deal with that? Well, we used to have a castle. We don't have a castle anymore. Uh, these were things with uh, my grandfather was a prominent citizen of uh, Czechoslovakia, as it was known back then. Uh, and he built um, many of the uh, Czech pavilions at, at, at many of the world's fairs. There was one in Paris, another one in Chicago. And he did the Czech pavilions for, for those things. And I mean, you know, he worked very hard and he earned his money and uh, decided to to purchase a castle from a famous opera star and ultimately uh, 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 couldn't use it very, very often because uh, just as he purchased it and fixed it up, that's when the Second World War broke out. And uh, long story short, he was forced to leave the country as a, uh, as a, as a refugee. And that was the end of that. Now that stinks. I, I think there's many of us who would, who dream of owning our, our own castles, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. Let me give you a tip. It's not as great great as it is as it's all cracked up to be. Very expensive proposition. We got it back when the uh, when the uh, uh, when Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, as it's known now, uh, became democratic, and it was a mess, of course. And we started fixing it up. Boy, oh boy, it was a major endeavor. But we ended up selling it off to somebody who wanted it more. So you're one of the three co-founders of Surtech uh, back in 1980. So can you talk, talk a little bit about uh, what transpired to get you there? I think you were in charge of the marketing plans, right? Uh, well, I, I was a co-founder, so I was that was my function to get marketing and sales uh, together. And, of course, I did that. But I, I was involved in a whole bunch of other things. 
establishing corporate policy and culture and uh, and what we wanted to be, what type of products we wanted to produce, what kind of quality levels we were going after, um, financing. There was a whole bunch of stuff going on. And this was back when most games shipped in plastic Ziploc bags, right? So, Oh, you bet. And we had our share in shipping a few products in plastic Ziploc bags. Our first product was actually released in 1979. It was a database program called InfoTree. And then from there, we released uh, in August of 1980 a product called Galactic Attack, which was a mildly uh, connected with uh, the Star Trek uh, TV series. And uh, it shipped in a plastic bag. And then in September of 1981, we shipped Wizardry, which is what we are known for. And we were the first company, actually, to ship a product to the market in a box. Wow. Uh, yeah. So we set, we set history there, too. And now, was, that, was that you? with the We need a box. We, well, actually, uh, I, I give credit to uh, the, 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 he was very insistent about it. And I, and I look back on it very happily. Uh, the guy's name was Bob Leff. He was the co-founder of SoftCell, a huge distribution company that... Um, really uh, gave everybody an opportunity to get stuff under retail shelves. He was the one that asked us to go to a box, and we looked at it and said, why not? This makes a lot of sense. That well, sounds like collectors like us owe a great debt to this man. You do. <laughs> uh, so you were, let's see here, you did a business degree, right, at Clarkson University? Yep. But you also did some programming work, but yep. I've got here that you hated hated bureaucracy, I don't know. Too many. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what was going on here. Uh, I don't remember exactly the context of of that. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I could speak generally to it. Nobody likes bureaucracy. Um, I, I didn't like any sort of games being played within our company. Uh, if there, there were any sort of politics going on, we put an end to that fairly quickly. So it was a very open. Um, company uh we we spoke our minds we didn't have things to... are you talking about surtech or the company that you worked before surtech uh i'm talking about surtech oh okay, okay. right so um i don't know I, I i don't know if that answers the question really but the... well let me let me back up a little bit so how did you get from this business degree to uh surtech i mean i guess you did you did do some programming along the way here somewhere right Yes, I did. Uh, where does the programming come in? Um, are you talking about uh, during the college days or after right. college? During college? Well, um, one of the one of the majors that I had was in programming and computer science, and uh, uh, I was messing around with punch cards, programming in Fortran for PDP eleven, and uh, the uh, you know, it, it was a lot of work. It was, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, coding and poach, uh, punch cards. And if you made a mistake, you had to redo everything. And it wasn't a whole lot of fun. Um, I don't know how it ties to the bureaucracy thing. <laughs> I don't know either, but I guess, uh, it sounds like you're saying that you, as soon as you got done with this degree, you went to work for a uh, Surtech, right? Oh, no. Her co-founder. Was there something in between there? That's what I'm wondering. That's your homework, Matt. Oh. <laughs> this is such a, this is, this is not a well-known fact. Okay. You must be referring to a company called IP Sharp. Uh, and that, that I, I started there as a systems analyst. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, one of my first assignments was to fly into uh, Cleveland and uh, there was a client there that uh, they they were having problems getting a system up and running. It was a pretty big financial system, and I was asked to fix that. And, uh, you know, fresh out of college, into a major Fortune 500 company, uh, which will remain nameless, major problems with the system, financial system. That didn't work out very well. <laughs> but in every dark cloud, there's a silver lining, and that led me to Surtech. And uh, it, it was wonderful because I didn't have to deal with the uh, uh, politics of a large corporation, uh, which I formerly was connected with. And, and we now had the uh, excitement of starting a company 
and making it successful. And, and there's nothing like it. I would encourage anybody that has an idea to go for the gusto and uh, get the right advice, get, get, get the right people involved, and just go for it. It's really well worth it. So the origins of the company, you know, there's, there's quite a bit I found about uh, Robert Woodhead and, and your, your brother Norm, right? Yes. Uh, Norman. And the, so the, these guys went to this, I guess it was Robert Woodhead that was hired to fix some problems with your dad's company. Is that, is that right? For yes. Spreadsheets, uh, data-based kind of issues. Exactly. That's how InfoTree was born, You've right? done your homework, absolutely. <laughs> My father had a firm and, and worked with um, uh, Robert Woodhead's mom, uh, who was actually the... Um, Janice, right? The, Janice, yeah, the majority owner of that company. Um, my dad got involved with that organization to help it along. This was before Surtec was started. It was a, a Resonated Sands foundry company. I'll be brief. Uh, basically, its product was uh, resin-coated silicone sand used to make molds for uh, industrial parts. So New York Air Brake was one of our clients, one of our customers. We would have to ship them train loads of silicone sand. And this was during the oil embargo of the early 70s. So freight rates were going up and down like a yo-yo. And, and we were calculating all these things by hand. Of course, there were no computers. But when the Apple II was introduced, that gave us an opportunity to computerize all of this. And that allowed us to quote prices for product before the you know the freight rates would change due to due to the oil embargo prices would you know gasoline prices would spike up and down and uh, uh, on a weekly basis and it, it just played havoc on on calculating your profits and and your margins and 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 what to quote your what your to quote your client anyway long story short uh, we coded a pro he coded a program uh, to fix this. And the deal was with Robert was I didn't cut the deal. My dad did. Um, if you program this computer program to help us in our business, you can use the computer afterwards to do with it as you please. These were very expensive, three, four, five thousand dollars to buy an Apple II back then. And uh, so there was uh, he was uh, thrilled with it, and and he started coding all these uh, video games, which really started Surtech. Um, it was his passion for video games uh, that that gave the company its products. I was uh, working for this for this large computer company at the time as a systems analyst, so I really didn't know what was going on then. But my brother was around, and uh, there was a uh, there was a show that Robert wanted to attend in Trenton, New Jersey. And he wanted to take this computer on a bus, and we didn't think it was a good idea to take this expensive equipment on the bus. And, uh, and so what was done was uh, my brother offered to, uh, to drive him down to Trenton. He uh, was planning on continuing his journey to Atlantic City to spend a little bit of time with the um, gambling parlors there. <laughs> I see. After he lost all his money within a day. He decided to leave and come back to uh, Trenton to uh, check out the show. And he was stunned with what he saw. Robert had people stacked 10 deep uh, checking the product that he had produced. He was uh, demoing Wizardry at that time. And uh, Norm was just enthralled and said, there, this, this is wonderful. We, we should do something. And that's, that was the beginnings of, um, of any serious effort. By then, I had joined the company. Um, and I was with him uh, shortly after that trip, and, and we started to get serious and formal about it. So it started with Robert Woodhead, myself, and uh, and my brother Norman. Is your brother Norman is he older or younger than you? A couple years younger. A couple years younger. What kind of uh, relationship did you have with him? Were you like <laughs> close friends or? Oh yeah, oh we are yeah. peas in a pod. Yeah, very close. And you both were into technology. Yes, absolutely, and uh, we were, you know, very complementary for each other in our business endeavors, and and we knew how to keep things separate. 
keep business stuff separate from our personal lives. So it worked, it worked out really well. We were together in business together until the close of the company back um, in, 19, in 2004. So. And your dad was also a big help, is my understanding. Uh, he provided advice from time to time. He also uh, helped us with getting our first distribution contract sealed, uh, signed, sealed, and delivered. Uh, but then he didn't really have a whole lot to do with it after that. He really wanted this to be a learning exercise for Norman and I and Robert, and, and it was. All right, so what about this game, Galactic Attack? <laughs> What's the story behind that? Uh, so it's definitely a lot far different game than Wizardry. Uh, yeah, it's a real-time science fiction uh, game. Um, they're putting uh, your taxi in my memory now. It's like been 35 <laughs> years ago. But uh, you were out there trying to use your, your – it was very rudimentary – CGA graphics uh, with and all they had back then was uh, like a green lime green kind of screen display <laughs> at any rate it uh, uh, your your goal was to get out there and uh, conquer planets and without without the we didn't call them Klingons but it was something else similar to it <laughs> without, without these enemies coming in and wiping you out so all, all similarity, all similarities to Star Trek being completely coincidental, right? The... Well, let's say it was inspired by the <laughs> Star Trek series, right? <laughs> but anyway, this this game made you enough money to to fund the wizardry development, right? Or is that is that how it works? Uh, well, it did absolutely, um, but we weren't getting paid, and um, we were just doing this out of a labor of love, and. Um, and so all these, there weren't any overheads uh, other than the use of the computer and the facility in which it was housed. Uh, you know, so what? It was there and, and we were there after hours and used it. So, um, but when the company actually started with any degree of seriousness, it, it needed capitalization. And, uh, and so my father stepped in and helped capitalize the, the startup. And uh, in fact, provided all of the capital for it and uh, these products that we've talked about infotree and galactic attack were helpful in in mitigating some of the costs uh, required for capitalization but it didn't cover everything and so when we went to market with wizardry with a whole different ball game we we ran ads full page ads and soft talk and uh, um Every month we were doing this, and, and we were traveling now to to meet with uh, vendors and stores, and uh, there were expenses being racked up that we had to deal with. So it sounds like all of uh, all of us wizardry fans owe a debt to your dad as well. I, yeah, absolutely correct. Yep. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of my interview. And in that part, we'll really get into the origins of the Wizardry series. So definitely want to stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you very, very much for your support of the show. It really means a lot to me, guys. Uh, you know, I can't thank you enough. If you would like to support the show, just go to the link in the show notes. Uh, it takes just a few minutes to set up that Patreon account, and you'll be really glad you did. You get lots of uh, perks, including these Google Air Hangouts. We just had one of those uh, this week, so uh, thanks to all you guys who saw that. Uh, let's see. News from the Matt Cave. Let's see. Uh, I got some uh, cool artwork sent to me by Albert Wint. I thought I would share these. These are some art artworks he designed with the for the uh, Planescape Torment, or inspired by Planescape Torment. Anyway, I thought these were really cool. I wanted to share them with you. Uh, that's Albert Wint. And then also, uh, I got a really cool gift from Roland. He writes in, I really enjoy watching Matt Chat each week and hope GOG.com enjoys the revenue you bring their way. Well, who knows? Uh, I thought you might enjoy this trinket. It's not collectible as I made it, but it is unique. I modeled it with a free 3D modeling program, Blender. I sent the file off to shapeways.com to be printed, then dyed the white nylon-based plastic with some gold. Okay, fine, yellow. <laughs> R-I-T dye. Enjoy or not, but keep up the great show. 
Uh, so I thought this thing was really neat. It's really appropriate for, for the episode, right? So it's a little wizardry, I don't know what you call this little display item, I suppose, but it really, he did a really great job. And you can see the, the three-dimensionality of this thing. So it's really, really cool. Appreciate that, Roland. It's kind of gotten me inspired to want to uh, see, you know, see what I can come up with in Blender and Shapeway. So thank you very much for that. So what about that ale of the week? Well, this week I've got a special selection from the Goose Island Brewery Company, pretty well-known brewery. Uh, this is their Belgian-style Abbey Ale. It's apparently a very limited edition Pear Jocks, or Perry Jacks. <laughs> uh, for those of us who don't make any pretensions of knowing French, 8.7% uh, alcohol by volume, so not too high, not too low, uh, right about where I like it actually. Uh, develops in the bottle for up to five years. Contains live yeast. <laughs> you know, uh, it's okay if your if your ale contains live yeast, but you really want to wash it in other places. Uh, let's see, a sediment may form. Uh, uh, bottled on 13th of November 2013. Okay, well, uh, not much else to see on the bottle, so let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this pear jacks. Or Pier Jacks, Perry Jacks, however you want to say that. Perry Jocks, let's go with that. I've been smelling it, it smells really, really nice. You can definitely smell that Belgian ale like flavor, very uh, peachy, a lot of apricot in this. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, a little more citrusy, even than I would expect from a Belgian style. So I'm really expecting this to be nice and tart. Anyway, let's give it a taste. Oh, and this is really, really good. Uh, really strong peach flavors in this, a little bit of orange. You're no surprise given that really citrusy aroma. A nice, thick, a lot of flavor. Uh, very pleasant. You don't really taste the alcohol. Uh, let me try it again. Mm. <laughs> yeah, just really, really good stuff. Not bitter. A little bit of a grape-like taste. Uh, a little bit of like a wine-like flavor to it, a bit of a bourbon uh, sort of, I guess you'd call that sort of a, like an oaky or smoky uh, taste to this. Very complicated, very rich, very nuanced. A lot of stuff going on here. Let me try it one more time. Uh, yeah, just, just a really, really good choice. And, uh, and I don't know what, what this costs everywhere, but it was actually one of the uh, cheaper selections at the uh, local uh, mart here, so I'm really impressed they were able to get this kind of quality out and then not charge an arm and a leg for it. So I'm going to highly recommend this one. A full five out of five drinking horns. Uh, pear jocks. I don't really see how you can go wrong with this one, especially if you like the Belgian style ales, which <laughs> of course I love. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotations about business and I <laughs> found one from Bob Hope, famous comedian as you probably know. It goes something like this. A bank is a place that will lend you money if you can prove that you don't need it. See you guys next week. Uh, what's this, sir? Very good. <clears throat> uh, well, that's a very sweet thought of both of you gentlemen, but I really don't need it. Until now. <laughs> See you guys in the emergency room, huh? <laughs> <laughs>